Welcome to the AUA News Inside Tracked Podcast. Today's Inside Track Podcast is part of the Voices series and is brought to you by the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Here we'll be joined in conversation with committee members, AUA members, and urologists from around the world to discuss how to build a strong, vibrant, and diverse urological community. Good evening. Thank you for listening to Voices. I am Dr. Lourdes Guerrios, a urologist in Puerto Rico, at the VA Caribbean Healthcare System and an assistant professor of surgery at the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine. I'm happy to join you today as host for a discussion about the growing demographic of women in urology practice and training. It's a pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Simon Tavasilen. Dr. Tavasilen is an Associate Professor of Surgery and Urology and Director of the Urology Residency at Brown University. She also practices at the VA hospital, serving as a section chief of urology where she oversees all clinical care and resident training. So the views expressed in this podcast are our own and don't represent the views of the VA system, the Department of Veterans Affairs, nor the US government. So Dr. Tavasilan, uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here to have this discussion. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very happy because it's important to mention that, that especially during the Women History Month, uh, that women are a growing demographic of urology care providers. So I believe the most recent AUA census uh, marked that just 11% of urologists are women, so which is even uh, up from 8% in 2019. Yeah, that trend is amazing. It's certainly changing the demographic of the workforce. We see that at my own residency program at Brown Urology, um, and certainly in the, the pipeline of the trainees who will become future urologists. Um, and it's certainly exciting to see how that will change the landscape of urology, our subspecialty and our field, and care for our patients. That's excellent. And here in Puerto Rico, we have five uh, women urologists, and there is a new generation that is just upcoming. So it's, it's going to change the landscape here also. So what are some practices that you believe have made women more interested in urology? You know, I think this fundamentally comes down to the fact that urology is a great field. We are a mix of medicine and surgery, and these are some of the reasons why anyone would choose to practice urology. We get to be very specialized in the disease states that we take care of, and, and clearly we take care of a lot of patients across the lifespan and, and certain different populations. Um, specifically for women, I think as we see an increasing number of trainees enter the pipeline, there's more opportunity for women medical students to potentially see a mentor or sponsor among them to say, hey, why don't I rotate on neurology? I think that critical opportunity of exposure during medical school is really important for someone to consider this as a field. Um, and so much more so if they happen to find someone who maybe is like them so that they could see themselves in that role, uh, in that field, maybe seeing the patients and caring for the disease states that we care for. Uh, and so I think that opportunity to find some amount of concordance is, is also critical. So uh, as a decision we make impacts our future, what should women interested in training and practicing urology consider when selecting a, a program? Do, do you think it's, is there any important aspect to, to consider? Yeah, you know, those five years of residency training are a truly intense and critical period of professional development. And I think the reality is that any program is going to provide you great and outstanding urologic uh, residency training to become that independent physician that you're looking to be. Um, but each of the programs has a different culture and a different set of people um, that kind of make up the fabric of the program. And so I think what I tell most uh, students as they're applying, you know, regardless of their gender, is to find a place where you think you might fit in, where you might find your people, um, and then figure out how they go about the business of training urologists. You know, what do those rotations look like? Where do they train? What are the different populations of patients that you might come into contact with? Who are the subspecialists? Who are the generalists? What does that case volume look like? Um, and then to take it one step further, I think, you know, potentially finding those folks, uh, if you're a woman in urology, you know, other women trainees who have been through this process or women faculty uh, can also be really useful for you to be able to develop allies within the workplace. Um, this is true across gender as well. And so I think um, apart from that sense of whether or not you fit in and are these your people, 
also finding outside potentially the division of urology, but through the other spheres that uh, you know of interaction you might have, the Department of General Surgery, uh, your residency cohort at large, who are the folks that you can lean on during the super intense times? Because uh, as we all know, you know, the training is the, the nights and the days uh, are long, but eventually the years are short and, and you get to where you're wanting to get to, to be that independent urologic surgeon. Yes, I mean, usually if uh, also if you have, if there is lack of female role models it may discourage uh, for, a, for a specialty, but uh, what you said is important. When, where do you fit? Uh, it could be, ideally all uh, females uh, models, but if not, it has to be a cultural like fit in that program. Yeah, you know, my closest mentors have been men in urology um, and they have been, you know, the folks who connect me to the leadership opportunities that I've had to grow within my career in urology. And so while I can speak for my personal experience, it was really critical to have women in my program. I think it influenced the degree of collaboration across teammates, uh, you know, very positively. Um, I think also there's a number of women who are faced with potentially being the first only indifferent, you know, women in their program. And if that's the case, then they might not have that built in support, but they need to then find it through other allies. Definitely. And probably in other specialties to, to feel uh, joined to them. So what is the impact uh, on urology of an increasing number of women in the workplace? As you know, the recent CU task force, we found that most common fellowship training was female pelvic reconstructive surgery, contrary to the AUA census, which was on oncology. Uh, so what, what, what did you think is the impact of, of that uh, demographic change? Yeah, you know, it, it's clear that the demographic that women represent within the workforce of urology are younger, more likely less than 45, and then also slightly more likely to practice in academics or pursue fellowship and additional, additional specialty training. Um, but what I think is really potentially unique about women increasing uh, representation within the workforce of urology is the reality that they might go on to care for patients who urology otherwise might not have spent a lot of attention on. So, for example, you know, the burgeoning field of female sexual dysfunction general urologists might not be tackling the care of this, um, but we see plenty of women urologists who really are and are bringing it from their subspecialty viewpoint to the mainstream so that all general urologists, regardless of their gender, uh, might increase the capability of us as a subspecialty to care for female specific problems outside of just FPMRS or, uh, you know, that subspecialty training. Um, I think also women have the opportunity to bring their potential um, expertise to the care of, sur of surgical disease. And so there's some data out there showing that women have great outcomes in the post-operative setting, that their the time they spent with patients is, is longer, that um, they have more opportunity to have shared decision, decision making, uh, that they're able to influence outcomes like mortality and uh, readmissions. And so I think the diversification of our workforce is only going to potentially increase uh, or improve outcomes for our patients. Um, I, I think also a, a more diverse workforce will more accurately re reflect our patient population and some degree of concordance, be it gender or race or any other social identity uh, between patients and, and physicians can engender trust, which can ultimately improve patient outcomes as well. And so I think the, the potential to unleash some of this talent within uh, that growing demographic um, has really potential positivity for the impact of patient care. Definitely. And even non-fellowship trained female general urologists uh, care for a higher proportion of female patients. So, so that's also uh, important to know. And you mentioned about uh, diversity. Uh, uh, as you know, we, as we know, diversity includes uh, many aspects of identity that it's not limited to race, uh, ethnicity, uh, gender, sexual orientation, physical abilities, among others. So how is the diversity and inclusion committee positioned to help modernize the AUA in terms of women's representation in urological leadership? Uh, what changes are taking place? Yeah, you know, I think the AUA was um, to be commended for wanting to take on this whole topic and think about how they can shift and change some of their policy and procedure to modernize. Um, and that started with the Diversity Inclusion Task Force, which has 
um, you know, provided a number of recommendations that have really been enacted on by the AUA to create a standing diversity and inclusion committee that's chaired by Dr. Bressler. And having a new position of a chief diversity officer or CDO, I think certainly signals as an organization and a professional medical society that the AUA wants to make improvements and progress in this area. I think it's telling uh, that the AUA, like many other professional societies, has, has never had a president uh, who's a woman. Um, and this is for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the complicated um, succession system through the AUA sections. And so, you know, we can think of both grassroots efforts from below and leadership uh, changes or policy and practice and norm changes from above um, as a bi-directional pathway towards increasing diverse representation and leadership. And you know, I think we can reasonably say that urologic leadership is not diverse um, and that this isn't likely to change in a passive fashion. Um, and that change is hard, uh, but also necessary. And so I see the potential opportunities for the DEI committee to um, have multiple areas of leverage and focus, you know, be it education matters, um, be it coordination of DEI efforts across the sections and our subspecialty work groups. Um, and these different focus areas um, as opportunities to advance that mission. I think the AUA certainly takes that very seriously and, and I'm appreciative of that. Um, but there's also multiple other groups and individuals at local institutions and in community practice who are working on these same issues of how do we address health equity. Um, and, you know, groups like affinity societies like the Society of Women in Urology or R. Frank Jones or the Hispanic Urologic Society. Um, all are working in different areas and methods to ensure that the talent that does exist within the pipeline is, is being advanced towards leadership opportunities. Yeah, definitely there is a, an intentional creation of, of this diverse leadership, and it's obviously needed to execute uh, the mission of the, of the AUA. So what are the key barriers that the AUA should prioritize to help advance women in urology practice? And you know, some of these barriers come down to the gender bias or sexism that exists mm -hmm. within our workplaces or in our culture, within our institutions and our organizations. And so, uh, you know, women fulfilling the role of uh, being a surgeon uh, might be new for patients uh, or, or sometimes for institutions. Um, and women simultaneously fulfilling that role with the, you know, additional um, caretaking duties that they often uh, are also responsible for within their home life um, is, is a challenge. I think the pigeonholing of women into practice arenas where they might be caring for more patients that are women than they are trained to do so or desire to do so um, also affects, you know, the level of success women are achieving within their careers. And so, I think those barriers are significant. When we speak specifically of the AUA, I think that uh, you know the ascension into leadership roles is uh, primarily dictated uh, through the section, and that overly complex system um, has led to very slow diversification of leadership. And so, um, you know, we need both those grassroots efforts for the, each of the individual sections to recognize and see the opportunity that exists uh, to modernize their own wards which then feed into the AUA. Um, and I think that can take, uh, you know, that can look like a lot of different things. That can look like the individual sections actively establishing their own diversity and inclusion uh, committees, uh, their own action plans and goals around these areas that are in synergy with the AUA. Um, it requires them to potentially, you know, identify their own chief diversity officer and to empower that person um, directly with decision making authority and, you know, communication with their boards to modernize those structures um, and think about how they can actively change those structures that are really no longer potentially serving them. So I think it's both individual, institutional uh, and organizational, um, you know, the avenues through which we can advance diverse representation. And I think also that, especially for underrepresented minorities with a uh, background, there is a need to to feel to be included, like increasing opportunities uh, for for students from minority institutions, not not uh, related to gender, but it's definitely it's it's needed a, a structural change. 
I think the point you make about it's not just diversity, but inclusion as well is so critical and inclusion is, is an active game. I think we can think of diversity in this zero sum game, um, or instead you can think of increasing the pie or adding more seats at the table. Um, and I think that latter approach really makes a lot of sense. Definitely. So your AUNE's article mentions the importance of intersectionality, identities on the DIE committee. So how do you feel you embody identities outside of being a woman in urology? How has it impacted your training and your practice, Simone? Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I think the issue of intersectionality first, I, I guess I would tackle that one and say that you know, the, we have so many identities and along human social identity, you know, might be gender, race, religion, veteran status, age, uh, you, you mentioned ability and disability. And I think all of these things can influence how we identify um, and how the world sees us and how we are perceived um, when we are functioning in our professional lives with patients or with staff and colleagues um, and our personal lives. And those, you know, those experiences influence how we see the world and how the world sees us. For me personally, um, when I went through training, I felt super supported as a woman in urology, um, both by my colleagues and my faculty. Um, you know, I would not infrequently come across patients who might not have expected me to be fulfilling the role of a urologist. Um, but I was able to kind of move through that and, and certainly have those tips and techniques that I use on a daily basis to maneuver those situations. Um, but in practice, I found that it, it was much more noticeable that particularly as a woman in surgical leadership, um, that my uh, way of leading or my approach to communication might be perceived very differently uh, than my colleagues. And particularly if you've been socialized within the world of surgery to be uh, direct, uh, agentic, authoritative, uh, take charge in the operating room, that that wasn't necessarily going to, um, you know, win me favor or uh, curry, um, uh, you know, favoritism. Um, and so I've learned to, you know, maneuver that, uh, constrain my use of authority, um, and, and uh, build relationships because I think that's how, you know, I'm going to be effective. Um, but I also recognize that as an additional task burden, you know, that is part of the identity that I have that I, I have to manage. Um, I coach a lot of uh, women residents and faculty who kind of are handling those same types of issues and, and how to navigate and negotiate it to be successful. Um, to get the job done that you know you're well trained to do, um, but that you might have to um, kind of navigate in a different way uh, than other colleagues. And so um, I'm also really grateful to have a ton of support, uh, both personally and professionally, for all the caretaking, you know, that happens around my family life also. Yes, that's, that's, that's great. And that's very, very important. So that, have, yeah, that definitely have been uh, had an impact in, in mentorship in your career. So, so uh, how to find a mentor? How are you feeding back in the pipeline? Yeah, you know, I think that that's probably one of the most important jobs and kind of what helps grow your legacy in a career is, is the generation that comes after you. And so, you know, my role as a program director I think that's really what motivates me to continue to do it is that we have a, a responsibility and an honor to to train the next generation of urologists um, also through my professional society work be it through the society of women in urology or the society of academic urology um, i've had the opportunity to really think about well how can professional societies um, tackle some of the big challenges we have you know we have a major workforce shortage for urologists compared to the patient population that we need to treat we have major issues with health equity and outcomes for patients um, that are part of vulnerable populations. And so these, these, there's no lack of potential you know, challenges and problems. Um, I find meaning in the fact that um, it, it can be a source of pride to potentially train a, someone to be able to have the skill set to be a urologic surgeon. And I think when you have those skills, you then have the potential you know, to impact the care of uh, numerous patients. And so that's what I focus on. Um, I'm also super appreciative of the mentors and sponsors that I've had personally, because, um, you know, that that's how I've arrived where I've arrived. Um, I look at our professional organizations like SWU as an opportunity to um, involve 
women urologists early in their careers while they're still in training so that they can uh, have colleagues and um, compatriots in this process. Because um, there's highs and lows with the career in medicine. Uh, you know, I think right now, doctoring in 2023 uh, is a bit of chaos. They, you know, they're between the, the struggles we're facing as a profession, uh, workforce shortages with nursing staff, um, th these are not easy problems and, and the ups and downs associated with burnout also are cycles that I think we all have to manage. And so I think organizations like SWU can bring together people to um, work through the same challenges that they're, they're facing. Um, and then within the Society of Academic Urology, I think there's also an opportunity there to really be on the forefront of how do we educate residents and how do we diversify that workforce so that it looks a lot like our patient population? Yes, I definitely couldn't agree more. And also, obviously, mentorship is important, but as, as you mentioned, sponsorship, it's its vital to remove the barriers that, that women have in, during their training and obviously gain uh, visibility. Uh, uh, it's really in, important that you maybe have a mentor or could that could also be a sponsor, but not necessarily. You have like a, a village that, that could help you uh, on both. So, no, I would uh, add to that. We're, we're so focused, I think, in American culture on that individualism that kind of you put in the work and the time, and the effort, and, and you rise uh, through the system. But I think we all know it's not necessarily just how hard you work, but it's also who you know. Um, and those decisions that are made behind closed doors about um, tapping on your network to advance, you know, that next colleague. Um, we we really can influence that if we're thinking intentionally about sponsorship as a systematic way to give voice to those who might not have been necessarily chosen or seen. Um, so I really love that point. Yes, I, I couldn't ag agree more. I really enjoy this this podcast. It has been really a, a thrill, and and thank you, Simone. For your time, I think leaders as uh, as you are a positive role model for all women in urology and future trainees, uh, but most importantly, opening the doors to others. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Simon, for, for uh, being with us uh, today. Thank you for having me, Lourdes. This was a great conversation and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Simon. This has been Voices. An AUA News Inside Tracked podcast brought to you by the AUA's Diversity and Inclusion Committee. For more information about the AUA's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, visit auanet.org slash diversity.